Hello, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the arts now as a token of its deconstruction. Um, we have three of our five panelists with us here, so there may be a couple more who join us, um, at which point we may pause and sort of introduce them and bring them into the conversation. Uh, but uh, before I have the panelists begin to introduce themselves, just as a couple sort of place setting, if you will, of the conversation come. The arts now as a token of its deconstruction is the title of this panel. And um, I will confess to being a bit bewildered and overwhelmed by some of the heft of what was being presented in the title. And yet I thought about it and realized that unpacking it a little bit can actually quite help in the sense that this introduction of the notion of deconstruction at this moment, in the sense that de as a method was in part about disrupting a binary. Um, it was about trying to reveal the binaries that had been encoded into some of the ways that we thought about things and trying to show a greater plurality. And there's something to be said for the fact that in a conversation around uh, art and NFTs, that there's a need for this because there has been this longstanding sort of divide, if you will, between mainstream contemporary art and new media art. The two terms I'm taking there are I'm taking from Ed Shankin, who wrote about this specifically in an article discussing whether there needed to be a digital divide or whether there could be a hybrid discourse. And I think part of what we want to try and attend to here is what is this hybrid discourse perhaps is developing? The other thing that's sort of interesting about uh, deconstruction here is that it's a method that's meant to try and destabilize the way in which something can get attached to a certain type of idea. And so that the way something seems to be becomes attached to a certain set of ideas that might not necessarily be conducive to being able to see things in new ways or be creative. And so deconstruction might actually serve a kind of good. And that brought me to the word token, which obviously refers to a form of currency but is also something that is used to present symbolic value, but with no practical effect. And I think it's important as we consider this you know, realm of NFTs and the impact that they're having on you know, the larger mainstream contemporary art world overall, we also sometimes question to the degree to which things appear to be making a difference, but may not actually be making a difference. And other things that don't seem to be making a difference, but perhaps are. And in this way, I just wanted to sort of suggest that as we look at this space, there's something to be said for looking at the rhetoric around it, for looking at the way in which we talk about this space and art and digital art and NFTs and our desire to distinguish between markets and worlds and see if we can't begin to identify some of the things we think are positive new additions and some of the things that are concerning overall. And so that is a kind of preview of some of the issues that maybe we'll get to attend to over the course of the conversation. Um, I will let the panelists each now take a couple minutes to introduce themselves, um, what they do, what they've been about, and how they have chosen or not to interact with blockchain and or NFTs. Um, and I figure so in some sort of, you know, freeing way, um, but maybe, Andrea, you would start um, since your first name begins at the start uh, of the alphabet. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, no, don't do that. Uh, okay, sure. Um, I'm Andrea Ackerman, and uh, I'm an artist, and I've been working with um, what's been called digital artists, and I've been labeled a new media artist um, since uh, about 1995, um, when I got my first uh, Macintosh computer. Um, and since then, uh, what I've used has evolved with um, the technology. And for the past several, well, since about 2000, I've mostly been working in 3D computer animation. Um, and uh, I made one piece which is pretty well known it's 
called Lowe's Breathing, um, which <clears throat> was my attempt to create a, uh, a virtual synthetic uh, life form of a new kind, um, which had, you know, uh, emotional connection and a sense of aliveness and a sense of complexity and a ambiguity. Um, and I'm actually about to come out with a new series called Torso Target, um, which is actually, which is along similar lines, but um, uh, I, it's more complex, um, it has more, it's, it's also more about what's going on in contemporary culture um, with, uh, women's identity and things like that. But anyway, uh, to be, uh, hopefully we'll be out soon. Um, in any case, uh, I, uh, you know, I've experienced the divide between new media art and traditional art. Um, and uh, I don't know, um, it, it's of concern to me um, but I think, I think that it is changing. Um, I'd say, you know, since I started working with it, uh, there's certain artists who've come out who I, I experience as working with, um, digital art, uh, dig, uh, digital means of creating art, um, in a synthetic way, um, so, uh, which um, are we supposed to start uh, talking about what? our point of view? Of and well, why don't why don't we let everyone introduce themselves and oh, then we okay. can get into All the right. conversation? Now, so. shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> um, who wishes to go next? Jason, I guess alphabetically, you're next in order. Perfect. Uh, it's lovely to be here. My name is Jason Salvin. Uh, I'm a practicing fine artist. Um, and a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, I have worked in computational methods for making art for galleries and museums since the 90s. Um, sort of, I would say, really explicitly deciding to, to use the creation of software that I'm writing myself and, and interacting with large data sets uh, to make fine art. Uh, my father's a painter, so I come from a sort of a fine art background. Um, so maybe I'm a bridge in some sense between uh, a kind of um, contemporary art world that sort of was primarily focused on physical objects, painting, sculpture, installation, etc., and the, the sort of new media digital world. My work's in major museum collections, um, including the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and lots and lots of others. And I've worked with galleries selling my work. So I've participated in the fine art market really actively since the 90s. Uh, so it's really, you know, it, I've had a sort of front row seat to the action computation driven sort of the fine art world for a long time, and including you know, exhibitions at the Whitney in 2000. So, so there has been, you know, the relationship between the digital ebbs and flows. And I think we're now at a kind of really interesting crescendo um, where native digital artwork is being taken maybe seriously, or maybe that's the conversation we'll have. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a reasonable introduction. Great. Thank you, Jason. Um, Thomas, perhaps you'd speak a little bit about. Absolutely. I think, huh, and I'm the odd man out. Uh... I'm a technologist. Uh, again, my name is Thomas Arul. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, I had a, my last company on the internet era, and I sold that to publicists in the French company in 2015. Then I wanted to do something apart from the e-commerce and internet, and I thought blockchain is going to be a huge game changer, and I jumped into it. And um, I started a payments company uh, on the blockchain for uh, crypto payments to bring it to the masses, especially B2B and B2C. It's called Bloomy, and we have a product called Bloomy Pay. Then NFT looks very exciting, and I sort of, okay, let me get into it, and uh, had my friend um, who, who worked in a lot of the largest companies in the U.S., in Amazon, and he, he said, okay, let's start a new company. 
just focus on NFT. And uh, we launched that uh, last year. It's called Abris. Uh, <clears throat> I think one of the things is we focus on is a curated marketplace. But let anyone create a storefront, including artists, social impact people, charity, anyone who wants to create a storefront and sell NFTs. NFTs could be digital NFTs. Uh, it could be photographs, video, art, music, as well as physical items too. So the platform is up and running and we are, on, we are almost 300 uh, different stores in the platform. Also, we are providing white glove services for uh, you know, <clears throat> a lot of people, uh, a lot of artists, no NFT, but they don't want to deal with crypto. So we're taking, you know what, we'll take care of everything. We'll help you mint the uh, NFTs. All we need is your bank account. So people can pay by credit card or pay by crypto, but you will see the money in your bank in your you know, as a wire. So that kind of the complexity and a lot of the artists are still skeptical about it, but we want to kind of hand over them. You know what? It's one more avenue. Whatever you're selling in a physical world, we'll give you an option to sell in the digital world as a physical item, as well as right, right now, there's a chance for you to create digital versions of it and sell it. And um, and also uh, power of blockchain, NFTs can have perpetual royalties. So that's something which, uh, you know, it's kind of bound in the smart contract. So that makes it much more exciting and uh, happy to be here. And also I'm wearing uh, yellow and blue, my Boston Marathon uh, T-shirt to support Ukraine. You know, I thought this is the closest thing I can wear to support uh, our friends in Ukraine. Yes. Well, um, thank, okay. So thank you all three of you. Um, so we're going to proceed without Krista and Maliha for now. And if they can join us at some point, uh, we'll welcome them. I wanted to just start on a positive note because I think it's very easy to land in the space of critique without having established some of the reasons why we might even be engaged with something Typically, we become interested in something not only because we dislike it or hate it, but because actually the good there, something that it hooks us into being interested. Um, and so with that, I was just wondering if there's one key thing that you have noticed in the last year, year and a half that you think NFTs have productively shifted in the conversations you're seeing or you're participating in in mainstream contemporary art. I, I have staying on one. I can I I, I can go. Um, <laughs> actually, I've, it's a great question. I have two that immediately come to mind um, that are frankly exciting to me. Um, the so as a person who's made digitally driven, digitally based art for a long time. I've been concerned about making it for galleries and museums. So that means making large prints, making uh, video installations, making objects that are familiar to a, to a contemporary art audience. The normalization of the, the digital file as an art form is fantastic. And it's, 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 been, it's been a long time. It's been something I've, I've been interested in. I, all my work basically is created via file. And then typically I find some other sort of form for the file, a photoprint, et cetera. So this sort of that we have across the broad culture kind of normalized a digital file as a as a meaningful and interesting form in and of itself is exciting and 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 um, uh, and I think it will I think it's sticky I think this is something that um, will continue on to the future wh whatever happens with the specific specifics of NFTs at the moment the other thing that is really Exciting and interesting is a kind of democratization. Um, you know, I, I have, being a little bit of an insider, I've certainly had complaints about the gatekeeping aspects of the fine art world and the ways that many people are sidelined just by geographic um, resource limitations. Some people will just never have a chance to work with a, a, a you know, a quote unquote good gallery just because they will never be in proximity to that place. So a kind of democratization of access for both creators and audience is also really exciting. It's also maybe problematic there too, but um, I, we I can get to that too. <laughs> so those are two things that I think are quite really exciting. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, Thomas. Just, yeah, one of the things that I think last year there is that um, there's a lot of excitement on learning what is NFT. I know there's a you know set of technologists uh, that are. Uh, aware of NFTs and they've been trading for quite some time, but 
the mainstream has started focusing on that. So even yesterday I had a panel and uh, uh, I had uh, almost the basic question. There was a lot of excitement. We talk about any other topic or any other panels, but if you talk about NFT, there's a lot of excitement from the mainstream. What is this? Why is someone buying a Beeple digital art for 69 million? What is the reason behind it? And uh, how does it work? Because I can have the same picture on my desktop and that is something the mainstream audience is adopting. Second is a lot of skepticism. I think there is a huge hype uh, where people are buying these monkeys and all these pictures for a crazy amount of money uh, with a promise that it's going to go up or uh, promise for uh, an access to special events with the utility of it. But I don't know how long the hype cycle is going to last. And that's why I want uh, companies to focus on real utility of these things and not the hype cycle. I mean, I think the things that you all brought up, the sort of the increase in education, the people's desire to learn more about a technology, I think um, for all of the excitement in past about virtual reality or artificial intelligence or some of the other you know, technology moments that we've had, even just in recent years, there hasn't necessarily been a drive to try and learn about how it works. Right. There's something interesting about the fact that in the NFT space, there's actually, even within general audiences, a curiosity to learn the functionality of it, which potentially is really important in the context of what Jason was talking about, about if we're going to normalize the digital art file as a form of art, then partly that that is necessary that people understand files and understand how technologies work and so can develop a sense of appreciation for the stack and for the different, you know, functionalities and so forth. Um, I want to point out that, Jason, you used the word democratization of art. Um, and I think that I think there's stuff still up in the air about that. But I appreciated the fact that you brought it up because it is a word that gets bandied around um, in the space. And I think, if I may, I'd like to introduce some of the words that get bandied around in the space. A lot of the rhetoric around blockchain uh, swirls around decentralization, um, trustlessness, uh, disintermediation, um, immutability, <laughs> right? There's these words and, and, with, and those words having these associations with like some kind of democratic force. Um, I'm wondering if you're noticing that these words that are sort of associated with blockchain are entering the language of how we talk about art, right? These are words that were associated with blockchain and it as a technology. Are we seeing, are you all seeing that shift over? Yeah. You want me to take it up? So, sure. so, so I think the... I think blockchain, yes, I think uh, people are getting the understanding of it, especially when you know, I have a payment company, people see the user paying without uh, you know any middlemen. You can pay to anyone in the world. Uh, if you traditionally, you have to anyway pay between 5 to 10%, but still the rails to final deliver in the local peso or rupee or uh, in the currency is not there. So that is one thing. The promise of blockchain looks great, but end of the day, you still need uh, exchange or something to convert. You know, so DeFi is great. A lot of people are money, uh, making money in decentralized finance. But end of the day, there's still a, you cannot use your uh, you know Ethereum or any other cryptocurrency for day-to-day -day transactions. That is one thing. It's still uh, way up. Though there's USDC or uh, you know a lot of the stable coins, but still end of the day, it's not accepted anywhere. You need to convert that to buy into cash to buy your milk or sugar or bread. You know, that's still and also what is happening is blockchain as good as us people do behind it. Today, OpenSea, 80% of the NFTs are fake. So the power of, you know, you know, OpenSea lets anyone, you know, anyone can just go mint an NFT. There's no, no one to stop it. All you need is a wallet, no check, and checks and balances, anyone can go mint it. But what happens in an environment like that is people are trying to make a quick buck. 80% of the NFTs are fake. There's no one to stop. There's no one to control. So that's why I think I completely understand why the art world is skeptical because there's a lot of hard work going into building something that someone can download it and claim that's themselves. You know? And that is one thing. And that's where the promise of blockchain is great. But finally, there should be some checks and balances to people who are coming in should be vetted and validated. So that's what we are doing on our platform. We don't let anyone mint, you know. We have an approval process. We want to do a KYC. Then we really let them in because we want to verify 
who you are. If Andrea says I'm an artist, I want to check Andrea's social media pages. I want to check Andrea's credentials. You know, have her mail validated. Then she can come and mint in the platform. So that checks and balances is important. Otherwise, people are going to take advantage. And uh, uh, you know, the blockchain might be promising, but it can be broken um, by people who are trying to make a quick buck. Mm -hmm. But um, Charlotte, are you asking if words that we use or are used to talk about crypto and blockchain and NFTs are then being applied to art, uh, mm -hmm. created art as what they're to talk about their aesthetic? Well, in the Is that sense, what you mean? I, well, not, whether it's their aesthetic or their practices or their markets, this notion of decentralization, immutability, transparency. I mean, I, for one, have heard the word transparency so I get a lot more um, attention, let's say, in the art market in the last yeah. year. Transparency was something everyone always sort of just laughed about, being like, oh, yeah, that's just not going to happen, right? Um, all of a sudden, transparency seems to become increasingly accepted, Right. Is, is that, you know, is, is this something that's shifting over because of all the sort of conversation around blockchain? Or are there other things that are going on socially, culturally, that are contributing to the desire of these concepts that are behind blockchain spreading, not because they're from behind blockchain, but because there's a cultural shakeout that's happening right now. And so these words, I'm just, I'm using them as like a reference point. Well, uh, I mean, from what I read, I mean, I'm not a participant so far in uh, NFT art or blockchain. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about these words like transparency or democratization, there's a disconnect between those words and what they actually mean and the reality of what's happening. I mean, for example, the democratization, I've read that um, most uh, in terms of distributed, uh, who's making money on uh, OpenSea or Super Rare? Um, it's the artists who've already known, or people who are already have social, you know, big social media following. I mean, when they uh, or, you know, already well-known artists um, to approximately the same percentages as you know might be found in the traditional, maybe a little bit better. Um, that, you know, transparency, I mean, there was recently an article about um, the, uh, this like fet fetishization of anonymity with, um, you know, screen names and usernames and um, even, and I think it was in the New York Times about investors not even being, uh, investing in companies without even knowing uh, the real identity of the people who are, uh, and then this, you know, sure. terminology, on the other, I mean, on the other terminology hand. called the rug pull. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, I think this is part of like this whole um, intensification of artificiality and, you know, that allows this kind of disconnection between these words and their actual meaning, you know, which is in reality and whether what they're talking about is really happening. It's, you know, to me, it's, if I can say something political, you know, insisting that, you know, the election was rigged. And he. I just I just jump in for a second. The, yeah. the, uh, I'm not sure that my experience of the fine art world that that crypto sort of language is directly showing up. But what I what I do sense is something you, you sort of pointed towards is there, are, there is a kind of cultural moment around certain kinds of themes, democratization being one of them, so transparency being another one. I'm not sure these are deeply held or whether these are more uh, performative um, kinds of themes. Um, uh, and I think the art world is engaging with those and taking those up. So there's a sort of performance around transparency for for say, high-end galleries, perhaps. Um, it seems to be part of the a, more of a broad cultural um, zeitgeist. I, I find the my experience of the NFT art world to be almost a completely different entity um, with basically no overlap with the world that I'm familiar with and comfortable with. And, and uh, another aspect of that that I think maybe is shared is there is a, a bit of an ahistorical kind of moment happening where 
we're not interested in precedents so we're not interested in does an nft look like somebody else's work we don't have, we don't want to have a conversation about sort of a to b to c the sort of the the story of fine art is a story you know that, that starts in ancient history but you certainly can start at, at the enlightenment you can walk through examples of work and and this is how we determine this is one of the methods we determine value and those kinds of conversations are literally non-existent i mean like literally non-existent and and that's interesting to be honest i think there's something interesting about an insistence on an ahistorical uh, being in the present approach to really expensive cultural objects. That's a, that is an odd set of circumstances. It seems brittle. I would be, I would not want to hold things like this in my own. Um, I would be concerned about uh, what's going to, what, what things will look like in a year. Um, but so, it's exciting and interesting. I mean, I think, you know, I will say from my, from some of my own conversations on Twitter, I, and again, who's going to talk to me but someone who wants to have a conversation around historicity, right? So there's, there's always a kind of flaw in referring to one's own experience because I have my own bubble, right? Mm -hmm. um, I write things I'm historically, so when someone tweets something to me, it's often because they want me to respond to it in that way, say. But... Um, and some of the, there's a, there's a recent uh, chain analysis came out with a recent sort of market overview of the last year. Um, last year, there was a sort of overview of what, who some of these new collectors are. And I just want to point out some information that I found interesting. They're described as uh, young entrepreneurs, rising financial professionals, which implies a kind of youth there, um, digital and crypto evangelists. And then sports, fashion, and entertainment crossovers. But this is this rising new collector base. And the criteria that they sort of were ex expressed as being important to them was that they were issue-driven, identity-focused, cross-genre, which I don't totally understand, but I'll leave that, um, digitally savvy, and that they wanted to redefine the canon. And so I'm bringing this up specifically because of what you just said, Jason, like this notion of redefining the canon. Yeah. Do you um, even know what the canon is? I mean, well, I mean, I'm always hesitant to say that people are like the, part of the thing about the canon is that it ha does ideological work. Like it kind of exists in the atmosphere, whether one knows it or not. People are like, oh, yeah, you know, Renaissance, Mona Lisa. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, like people, there's a kind of canon that exists, whether you've spent multiple semesters studying art history or not um but that maybe that canon itself even that sort of most general one is being revisited and i think you know i wanted to bring this up jason because i think it's in a sense that some of the criteria that just got mentioned there seems like they would speak to a real interest in the type of work that you or Andre are doing as well as some of the work of the types of artists that you know could be on abris um so the question remains why does it seem as if the divide keeps occurring? Why does it seem as if that can't happen? Um, I, I'm really interested to know more about your your reference there. My own, I have, so I, I have also not minted anything. I have approached a lot and have had a lot of conversations about about what minting would look like for me and my own concerns about the kinds of risks that I might be taking in in getting involved directly. Um, my experience with talking with traders, like people, typically young guys who are like buying and selling NFTs all day. Um, and they're, I have some really interesting, frank conversations around this. They're not looking at the work at all. Literally, some of them are not literally looking at the files. They're looking at social media metrics and trying to buy on that, that, that basically in the NFT market, social media metrics represent the kind of fundamentals that would exist exactly. in the stock market. Well, they're, they're what I'm, you call technical traders. They're trading on the technicals, NFTs, which is just hype bubble stuff. Which totally. Is incredibly fragile and incredibly, uh, you know, um, brittle. Also interesting and exciting, but, you know, an odd way to build a collection of art. Well, but hold on a second, because yeah. this is, I mean, really glad you brought this up, because actually you can even find online some of the, calculus, if you will, around how to identify these upcoming collectibles. Yep. This is, I think, one of the challenges, right, that right now in market analyses, and of course, here we are, we were talking about NFTs and art, and we're already talking about the market, right? There seems to be no way to not go there. Right. But 
part of it has to do with the fact that art and collectibles are grouped together, distinct from anything related to gaming. And I think that this that the mar- that the market analyses are grouping art and collectibles together is is interesting and speaks to something else culturally, right? In the way art operates as an asset class, maybe and so forth. But at the same time, it's super problematic to your point, Jason, because in fact, many of the artists I know who have worked with NFTs are not producing collectibles, have no interest in that kind of generative art project, right. are doing you know singular three. Essentially, the NFT operates as a means of selling the work as opposed to being inherent to the work itself, mm-hmm. right? And so. It, I, I can't help it. I can't help but wonder, are we, are, is this a vocabulary issue? Is the fact that when we say the word NFT, art and collectibles get collapsed when in fact what we need is to start distinguishing them so that there can be a space to speak about projects that are not operating in this collectibles context? Yeah, if I may add, um, you know, as a, I also read the chain analysis crime report on NFT. I think mm-hmm. that Yes, there are some, you know, collectibles that are really doing well, like Bored Apes and Pong, which is like, you know, few of them established earlier. And uh, definitely, I think there's a big coalition between social media followers and stuff. A true art, an upcoming artist, he does a beautiful work. No one cares about it. They look at, you know, the celebrity is dropping a signature or the celebrity is dropping this, uh, this sportsman, Tom Brady is dropping a signature or Logan Paul, right, you know. So those are the ones that is getting more attention and more value because he has 10 million followers. But a true, true artist who sits and draws doesn't get any attention. There's no way for him or her to get to any sales, you know. So though the 80% of the open sea is counterfeit, there are certain people across the world who genuinely draw or genuinely do stuff who doesn't get attention, number one. And number two, there is a lot of scams happening, especially in the collectibles and NFT side, where um, you know if you put a monkey and you create a monkey collection and you say it's uh, you put it for hundred dollars, so and all, you know you can start with hundred dollars, and you buy ten of them or three of them, whatever, and the price increases and someone buys that for thousand dollars, you get ninety, you get the reward because you already bought the NFT, you had to pay like whatever commission to that platform. And if someone, some sucker comes and buys it off for thousand dollars, you already made your money. Mm-hmm. So it's a endless opportunity for a lot of people to come and whitewash. Look at the chain as report. A lot of the NFTs have this whitewash scam. People put them and buy them by themselves and try to increase the price. Some other person comes and gets sucked into it. So again, I still think that the hype cycle is there, but the real utility, once the hype crashes, there will be real utility where Arts can be tokenized. This utility of NFTs, where uh, you know you have events in the metaverse where tickets can be sold, or an art gallery can sold tickets as NFTs. Um, how do we empower the artists by paying royalties? A lot of these use cases are good, which is going to be um, coming in the next uh, few years. Yeah, I am. I think the thing you described, Charlotte, is actually the condition that we're in. We're in a, a great flat. Um, you know, the there are in this space certainly the digital technology is naturally flattening, right? It, it is a uh, it, it sort of all information is zeros and ones, which is a natural sort of property of flattening um, data and experience. Uh, that's that's a little bit sort of heady and philosophical, but we can get more direct with this the space of say. You know, digital files assign pointers to on blockchain uh, and kind of, you know, maybe con people into thinking they have something they don't, which is a, a side thing we could discuss. But but um, it actually is the condition that if I post something to one of these markets, I'm in a big grid with a bunch of other people. And there hasn't been any gatekeeping that would sort of acknowledge my own historical work and it's a, it, and, and this sort of flattening is across the board. Uh, and, and so right now, there isn't much to distinguish a game NFT file or, a, or this kind of collectible from a celebrity or some artistic expression or some artistic expression that's just a total ripoff of a Basquiat or some other expression. I mean, all of these things exist in this sort of like um, uh, sort of flattened 
grid, but, grid, grid space, yeah. And then what, what actually, uh, you know, confers value is how do these things pop via Twitter and other social media mechanics? And, and you know, that's why celebrities are such, that's why it is so a valuable commodity for celebrities because they naturally have a lot of muscle. If the metric is just a sort of really raw popularity metric. This is a problem for making good culture, by the way. Like, you know, if we if we always just judge our culture by like, is it yummy? This immediate experience of like it's yummy, we would have had a lot of shitty culture. Uh, so, you know, one could argue we do. And, and how we navigate this is going to be interesting. I I would suspect that uh, uh, as was suggested, after there's some sort of reset, I think there will be value for artists to 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 use the blockchain as a way to sort of confer ownership. I think that will be actually valuable. I think I think there's long-term positive things that will come out of this, but we're in a really interesting, odd, maybe perverse moment where there's just a lot of there's a lot of sort of churn, you know. And, and I certainly wouldn't want to be caught up in the middle of that, but um, it's interesting. I'm gonna. I want to just say say a little bit, just to you know, I, on some level, I agree with you, but I just want to say to some galleries out there doing this work, right? I think it's important to point out that KCB has launched Ferrofile, um, and Ferrofile has done a lot of work. It's a blockchain only gallery. It does the work of contextualizing the work. There's often a curated note that accompanies every exhibit. Um, Bitforms obviously launched BitArt. Now those are tend to be focused on solo shows around an artist, right? Transfer Gallery and Left Gallery, the pieces of me that got mentioned in the recent New York Times article again, you know, and that was a really important. So, I mean, I do think, you know, I mean, I would say for art blocks, the curated space, you know, does the work of trying to contextualize why those particular artists are doing the work that they're doing on art blocks so that it it isn't just like, you know, shiny, but actually but relevant isn't, isn't that you know in the end having to repeat the same filtering process or a similar filtering maybe a bit more open that you know well that's... You know, the more the the more significant art you know rises but to that's my get point. more attention yeah i mean, I I mean I, that... which i think is good uh because you know it's certainly discouraging to see um you know oceans of a kind of you know, a few homogeneous strands of, of derivative art um, or, you know, art that is very valued, you know, and it's more valued because it has, you know, one purple sneaker instead of two blue ones or whatever it is. Um, you know, like in the Board 8 Yacht Club, if we're allowed to, you know. Um, I mean, I read basically that was the brainchild of a couple of couple investors who then hired designers to follow their instructions and you know they added their own aesthetic and you know made 10,000 with um, variations computerized variations and the people who are the customers for this are people they they their minds are different they 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 get excited by you know uh, these things i mean truly they do right uh, you know? I mean, I, the, I will always say that I think that, you know, it's true. I think that there's a space to recognize, however, that, and this is what I was bringing up around the rhetoric, transparency is a complicated notion and it's not always to the good, right? There are reasons why people want privacy and there are appropriate reasons for privacy. Um, at the same time, the art world is already moving towards a greater transparency around requiring KYC and AML, right? Those regulations have already appeared. The blockchain space is in conflict with that. And so already some of the platforms have declared that they will engage in KYC and AML. So pseudo anonymity goes out the door. Transparency is encouraged in that way, right? Decentralization, there's no, you know, I mean, I'm going to go back to the deconstruction side of things and just say one of the big issues with the notion around deconstruction and the sort of notion of plurality was that actually sometimes some people need to be centered, that there's a reason sometimes to center certain peoples or ideas. It actually is a good as opposed to having this kind of flattening that suggests everything is equal. Um, and so expertise, you know, expertise is of some value and yes, uh, history of something is of, of some value. I do want to acknowledge what you said about, I think there are interesting integrations with um, people who are a little more contemporary art savvy in the space. I think all that's true. 
I, I think, you know, I know we're running a long time, but maybe for me, the most promising aspects will be the ways that NFT or blockchain based authentications intersect with real world objects. Um, you know, the, the other the other thing that we haven't brought up just about the art part, uh, seeing only looking at things on screens is a very impoverished way of experiencing art. This is this is not the, this is not the way. I mean, going and seeing things in person that have size, scale, and maybe even like you know texture and scent. These this is this is part of being human. And this idea that we're going to just look at like you know little pixel beds and like have <laughs> order of experiences is, is just completely absurd. But there isn't there will be kind of interaction with with blockchain and i mean i i have i have issued certificates of authenticity for much of my work for 20 years and this is a better way it, it obviously it, it is a better way of having a, a, a certificate of authenticity it's what i'll i will move toward in my own practice um as a way of authenticating works that exist in a physical space but have some file basis that needs to be sort of pointed toward i think that's a that seems to be a great function um yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that it points to there is just, you know, this ongoing professionalization of the artist where the artist becomes increasingly personally responsible for their certification, their provenance recording, their databases, their yeah. pricing. Like, you know, it's just increasingly like oddly, inc increasingly responsibility descends on the artist, even as there are these various intermediaries. Yeah. Um, I w I'm wondering if Andrea or Thomas, you want to have, as we are getting to the end, um, any things you would like to contribute around things you're hopeful for in this space or things you're worried about? Uh, and I think, uh, you know, what my concerns earlier, I think there's a hype cycle and a lot of people are going to um, lose money thinking that, you know, we need to have something valuable you know, to buy. You, know, you don't want to buy monkeys and donkeys for X number of dollars, you know, uh, because it is, I think it's uh, you know, biggest scam because uh, the color is purple, the hair is purple, and that is not real world, you know, it doesn't, you know, I know you buy stocks, there's a value or something behind it, but uh, in a monkey with a background of purple with a, you know, red with a different variation, uh, that's not going to last, but definitely there's a lot of utility for NFTs uh, when it comes to metaverse and being playing with that. Uh, people virtual world. It, I know um, Jason doesn't want to look at Pixel, but look at Metaverse, you know, like you wear the goggles, you're in a different world out there. I didn't believe it till I started using it. So there is going to be a world out there where, you know, NFTs are going to have utility where uh, linked to a physical art, you know, physical asset that is going to happen in the future. And that's bringing more value to the blockchain as well as, uh, you know, people can be empowered across the world using this technology. Andrea? Um... I'm pretty skeptical at the moment. I'd say if uh, there's one thing I could be hopeful about would be, uh, um, as Jason was saying, that you know NFT could be a way of um, uh, authenticating your work and uh, having it more direct connection with um, collector or gallery. I, I too share um, the idea that you know. The way the form that the NFT art is used now is, you know, it's a very limited medium, um, and you know, uh, it doesn't. Ha I don't think it has to be that way. I mean, it can be used in other ways. And if it gets more dissociated from um, having to use cryptocurrency, I think that could be useful. Although I, I don't know if you guys saw, there was just an article. I think it was in the Times. Uh, that I, this, I think it's a gallery, Neon, uh, downtown Manhattan, got a storefront with a vending machine mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yep. for, where you could use, uh, you know, fiat currency credit cards to buy um, NFTs, yeah. NFT yeah. art ranging in price from like $5 to $420. But, you know, when they showed the pictures of it, it you know, it was the, uh, these pictures of you know, just like color form pigeons, <laughs> the way I think of it. It reminds me of color when I was a kid. Um, I, guess, I guess the thing I'll just say is one last sort of remark, if I may. You know, obviously on some level, I can't help but agree with you in the sense that I'm not particularly in, I mean, I think generative arts itself can be very interesting. Um, and I, I want generative art not to always get lumped in with things like these 
you know, the boy apes or the pudgy penguins or whatnot, because, you know, there are distinctions to be drawn between these projects. Um, yeah. But I would say, I wonder if there isn't something good about maybe young people becoming at this point interested in looking at things and beginning to think about what they want as visuals in their Enorm, and that collecting is a part of that and that maybe mm -hmm. there's value you know fiscal value associated with recognizing the creation of that and that in time and again i'm being hopeful here but in time discrimination and ongoing discourse will help to cultivate greater insights and greater critique um here we shall see <laughs> are you um, always I optimistic no, I'm actually an absurdist. I don't believe in either, but um, I think it's a, uh, a possibility. I think it's. I, I think there's. Um, this is the normalization. I think that we're talking about. People are are having experiences with how rich they are is something we can argue about, but they're having real experiences with sort of art object or art adjacent objects. That's good. That's that's certainly different than 30 years ago, right? So, you know, as an artist who who makes digital things. Ultimately, that is a good thing. Um, so, you know, obviously I can have my complaints, but I think there is a, a, a positive spin on this too. Yeah. Well, I mean, we are thinking out of time. We're allowed to talk about this forever. We probably will continue to have this conversation in our own circles. Um, it has been a pleasure chatting with you. Um, I hope we will all remain in contact and thank you to our audience members. Um, take care. Thank you. Right, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. -bye.